and you can hear us, or we can hear you, so that's a good thing. Is that Pat? We're having some people still trying to get on, so um, I guess we'll go ahead and start with them. There is um, a sign-in sheet at the front door, so if you could just sign in, just let us know that who was here, who wasn't. Um, just make sure. Is everything okay? Good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, so now we'll officially start. So I'm Liz Ulrich. I am the Analysis and Planning Services Section Supervisor, a lot of S's, um, and thanks you know, for taking the time out today to either come to the meeting in person, call in on the phone, um, watch on YouTube, and if you're watching this at a later date on YouTube, thanks for taking the time. Um, we really appreciate it. We know everybody is busy, especially in the spring. Everything starts picking up. So thank you for taking the time. We um, do have a couple of goals for this meeting. One biggest reason, we want you to know what we're up to. We want, we're kind of accountable to you guys, so we want you to know um, if we're going to be having some rule makings, if we're going to be making some programmatic changes. We want our stakeholders to know about those things before we take them to the Board of Environmental Review or before you see them in the paper somewhere. Um, seems like a better process to us to let you know things up front than after the fact. Um, and second, we really do care what you think. So this is, we really are striving for this to be a really interactive process. We want dialogue. If you have questions, ask the questions. Um, if you're out in the field and you see something that you don't understand or doesn't seems a little wonky, that's my word, a little wonky out there, please um, get a hold of us. We need to hear those things too. Um, we aren't where you guys are every day, so we need to hear those things here in Helena. Um, or at our branch offices. And of course, you can, if you see something today that you have questions about after the fact, please feel free to get a hold of the presenters or really anybody in the Air Quality Bureau. Um, I do want to introduce one person that is always open for questions. I'm going to volunteer for that. Um, but Rebecca Hardridge, she says here, she is the one that sends out the emails that you guys receive, and she really puts this meeting together. Um, she puts together a presentation, and she just takes care of the logistics. And she has a question, she has an answer for most any questions, or she can definitely figure out who to give them to. So you've got her email, you can send those questions to her and she'll give them to us. Um, a couple of logistics before we start. This meeting is being streamed on YouTube. This is being recorded um, to be put on YouTube at a later date so people can watch it after the fact. There's that little information for you, so don't do anything weird because you. I think we're the only ones that are on, but <laughs> you may want, you know, somebody might hear it later, so now they'll also hear that out of me. Um, please speak into the microphones if you do have questions. Grab one of those so that the people um, on the phone and listening to YouTube can also hear those questions. Um, again, sign in at the front door when you um, leave. We're going to have a little break so you can go ahead and do that at that break time. Um, and for the people that are on the phone, please feel free to um, interrupt us or to let us know if you have questions. Sometimes you guys are the for forgotten bunch out there, but we do appreciate you taking the time to listen. So please um, go ahead and stop us if you have questions or concerns. And with that, I was gonna, let's go ahead and start introductions and let's start on the phone. So who do we have calling in? Ashley Jones with Trinity Consultants is here. Ashley. John Reedy with DEQ. Linda Wynn with Montana DEQ. Stephen Cohen Whitney Duranic with Montana DEQ. <laughs> Joe Ugarowski with Montana DEQ. Hi, this is Jan Sunderbrenner with the EPA in Denver. Lynn Reed with One Oak and Tulsa. Pat Orlich with CHS. Okay, sounds like everybody. Um, now we'll go ahead and go around the room and do introductions here. Karen Helfrich with Pioneer Technical Services. 
Sounds like everybody. Hi, I'm now we'll go ahead and go around the room and do introductions here. David Gary, Montana DQ. Karen Helfrich with Dev Skibisky, Vice in Engineering. Jeff Briggs, Ashgrove Smith. Gordon Criswell, Talent Energy. <clears throat> Abby Krebsbach with Montana Dakota Utilities. Troy Burroughs, Montrose Air Quality Services. Anil Williams, DEQ. Doug Kinsley, DEQ. Norm Mullen, DEQ Legal. Julie Ackerland, DEQ. Julie Merkel, DEQ. Rebecca Harbage, DEQ. Dave Clem, DEQ. Kristen Martin, DEQ. So obviously we have a lot of DEQ people. Um, and so a lot of those people that we're calling in are people in our remote offices. Um, and then we also have people um, with DEQ watching it or listening to it here in the building, but we just don't want that to be a really heavy, have the room filled with a bunch of um, with people just checking out. We really are interested in what you guys have to say. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce Mr. Dave Clip, our Bureau Chief, for um, a couple of updates and chat with us. All right. Um, let me raise this. Thanks, Liz. And, and again, I want to reiterate what Liz mentioned. It's um, very much appreciate not only the staff that have pulled this together, but everybody who's made the effort to either carve some time out on your day to out of your day to participate by phone or to drive long distances for this meeting. Um, the agency in general, and especially the Air Quality Bureau, really benefits in the implementation, development of our programs, and the uh, certainly the protection and improvement of air quality through a very robust stakeholder involvement. And we take this very, very seriously. We're on about pretty close to, I want to say our 25th year of stakeholder involvement with CAC. And it started roughly around 1993 and it's evolved. And in 1993, we did not have YouTube and all of the technical availability or technical capabilities that we have today. So for those in the room, um, those who are not in the room, there was a video camera walking around the room here at the beginning of this meeting. And we're, we're not pulling a fast one on you because you, you signed in, right? You didn't waive your right for the, your video to be displayed wherever. Uh, um, the Coal and Open Cut Mining Bureau is putting together a video of coal mining and they've hired a, a, a private entity to come in and uh, shoot some video and talk about coal mining processes and revegetation and those types of things. And they found out we had a CAC meeting today, and so they asked if they could shoot what I would call the B footage, just some background stuff that, that might find its way into a coal mining video. Uh, so they were here for a couple minutes, walked around, and and they are now gone and, and we're not necessarily, I was disappointed they weren't interested in the air quality stuff, but they, they were very much interested in the layout of the room and the processes that we employ to develop, implement, and run our programs moving forward. So that's what that's what was about. A couple of the updates I'm gonna give are related to the session and some air quality fees. Some of these are kind of routine or have become kind of routine. Um, routine's not always a bad thing, but the legislature has um, wound down their business and for those tracking it air quality was was pretty quiet one of the more quiet sessions certainly for air quality in, in recent history there are a couple bills that I would like to talk about um, one of the bills is Senate Bill 190 uh, Senator Phillips out of Bozeman introduced a bill uh, requiring the Board of Environmental Review to develop programs which essentially would be us for greenhouse gas reporting requirements as well as a plan to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the state that was a bill that we testified at informational for those who, who tracked that. Um, we had some fiscal implications associated with that bill. That bill did not pass, as most, if not all of you know. And that is a bill that, uh, this was not the first time that that bill has surfaced, and probably in our lifetimes here, or our careers, unless they're well, very, very short, it's probably not gonna be the last time that, that the concepts in that bill are introduced. And so I say that because Sometimes it's best to understand what has been tried, what has not necessarily passed, and maybe what some of our future uh, might involve. So just park that in the back of your brains for the moment. The one that folks I'm pretty sure are very interested in is Senate Bill 337 introduced by Senator Ankeny, um, and that uh, eliminates the Board of Environmental Review. 
I just checked before I came. I know there's this interesting thing that happened when the Speaker of the House goes back to Culbertson. And that bill was signed by the Speaker on May 10th. I have no idea if that's on the governor's desk or not. Um, I know once it hits the governor's desk, I'm not exactly sure of the process. Um, there is a time frame that the governor has to sign it, let it pass in the law, I think it's 10 days, um, or veto it. And we have no idea what that means or what will happen with that. Um, the agency was there as, as informational in, in one house and as an opponent, I think, in, when it was transmitted to the other house. Um, but I'm not exactly sure what is going to happen with that. There are some questions that are out there related to board membership. So let's assume for a moment that the BER remains, that Senate Bill 337 does not take effect. Um, this last session, if you watched, there were a couple Senate resolutions um, that never passed out of Senate to confirm three of the members. They were not acted upon. They were signed to committee and, and they were not acted on. So the BER, those three uh, members are no longer members of the BER. That leaves four. So every election year, the new governor has the opportunity to appoint a quorum. Those four, their terms, while they expired in January 20, uh, of 2017, they remain in their position until they're replaced. So we currently still have four board members, a quorum of the board, uh, for department business. Um, Liz is correct that we want to bring all of our rulemaking in front of this advisory council before we go to the BER. Um, but we're not sure, we're, we're still assuming there will be a BER meeting here in a couple weeks, but a lot of it depends on what the agenda items are, and if there are agenda items where one or more of those board members have to recuse themselves for a conflict of interest, then you don't have a quorum. <coughs> so right now, um, patience is a virtue that I think we as a, as a bureau and I think across the agency need to employ until it becomes clearer to us what's going to happen uh, with the Board of Environmental Review. So I will pause there for a moment before I get into the budget side of things, which will inform the air quality fee discussion. That's the legislative side of things. Um, are there any questions first by anybody on the phone about what I covered or what I did not cover? All right, thank you, pregnant enough pause, I think. Anybody in the room? Clear enough, clear as mud? All right, budget-wise, um, fortunately, you know, the, the agency, I want to just say fair, fairly well. Um, from an air quality perspective, we did not have any decision pack packages specifically asking for additional uh, in increases in appropriation or resources or, or anything like that. So I want to just, I want to say it's fairly vanilla, pretty status quo. From a, from a budget side, um, that is our appropriation. Uh, of course, that is that is obviously not the cash. We're, we have a small amount of general fund that funds our program. We're roughly 80% fees, and 15 to 20% of, uh, of the remaining funding for our program is with federal grant, and really small portion of general fund, and there's a natural resource operations account which is tied to oil and gas development as well as mining and whatnot. And I know those have been somewhat depleted in the past. But we have not asked for anything. And, and what that really translate to, translates to for those folks involved in our program is that we are not anticipating that we need to bring in front of the BER or the department, if the department is the rulemaking entity, uh, any changes to fees for air quality applications, operations, registrations, or open burning. So in essence, our fees are remaining the same. So it's been about eight years since we've increased our fees. The last fee increase, we went from roughly $32 a ton um, to $38 a ton. I, that was a result of the 2009 session. And so what we have been trying to do is change a lot of our operations so that we're, we rate we remain at least as effective in implementing the air quality program. But we're trying to optimize our efficiencies in running those programs. That translates into the registration program that was developed for oil and gas, oil and gas wells uh, many years ago. And we're still undertaking a lot of those efforts. And you will hear a lot more uh, from other folks as we speak today on the agenda. That effort is still underway. 
and I know there's a lot of folks that may be watching this, I want to emphasize one thing. We're not looking at backing off on the protections. We're looking at different, more efficient ways to implement or retain those, those protections you know, for air quality that, and focus on those areas that we really need to focus on um, moving forward. So that's the state, state budget. That's, um, the statute requires us to go in front of BER um, or ourselves by September 30th of every year to report on the fees, and that's going to be the report. Um, right now, um, we're, our, we have more appropriation than we collect in revenues. That's going to be a future conversation for this committee, CAC, to talk about moving forward. How do we align revenues with appropriation? You don't always increase revenue, sometimes you shrink appropriation. And so those are topics that we're going to be discussing in the future. From a federal perspective, I don't. I, I know we've got EPA folks on the phone, and and you know, uh, please feel free if, if there's any information that I either misrepresent or um, uh, don't talk about. For the remainder of this federal fiscal year, which is federal fiscal year 2017, I want to say it's, it's pretty well status quo, at least from a federal grant perspective. I'm certain a lot of you have read in the newspapers about what has been proposed with this president's budget, and maybe what might happen for federal fiscal year 2018. Um, we don't have the final data points for that, the final proposals, or we, we don't know what to anticipate. I just anticipate the budgets are going to be a topic of conversation that we're going to want to remain engaged with all of you on, on a very frequent basis. There's another, yet another reason for this committee, this advisory council, to get together at least quarterly, and if we need to, um, even, even more frequently than that moving forward. So I'll stop there and um, pause for a moment for any budget-related questions. First, with folks on the phone. All right, anybody in here? All right, well, well thank you very much for your attention. Um, I'm going to introduce Hobie Rash. Um, I think all of you know Hobie. And Hobie wants to talk about some field presence and some opportunities we have to get better at doing what we're doing uh, moving forward. I'm going to apologize to the group. I have another commitment that I need to go to. And I, I, if I'm done in time, I will be back. But I'm going to remove myself and leave you all in the very capable hands of um, the DEQ staff and the master of ceremony, Miss Liz Aldrich. Please pepper her with lots of questions. So thank you very much for coming and thanks for your attention. Mr. Rash. Well, thank you, Dave, and uh, I want to be today a poster child of what it means or what it looks like to wear a lot of different hats. So, you get that? <laughs> that's what happens when you try to wear too many different hats, and, and that's what's been going on here. Maybe my boss is in the same bucket, I don't know, but... Um, can you back up a little bit? So, here we go. What we want to do today is we want to get to some details about um, increased field presence. So if you look at your agenda for today, you can see that the topical heading there really are bureau updates that we want to accommodate together. And this one is about this notion right here, and increased field presence on our part as we try to engage more and more efficiently with a, look at that, with um, with all the entities in the state of Montana and nationally that are involved in this notion of air quality here. So that's what this is all about. In order to get to the weeds, though, I wanted to provide just a little bit of background. And in order to do that, we're going to think a little bit about this notion of compliance. So oftentimes what happens is when we think about compliance, this is the image that comes to mind. Where somebody's out there to bust you, somebody's out there to write you a ticket, um, somebody's out there, sometimes we call them a nasty gram, right? Or maybe another image that you might think of a little bit is here's nasty DEQ with a monster big hammer ready to pound away and hammer away on industry in particular. And oftentimes that's the image that comes to mind as we think about the notion of compliance in the air quality world. And so that leads then to the idea or the concept perhaps that within our tool belt, if you don't mind me using that analogy, we really have just 
one tool. And that's the only way we have to reach air quality goals or to carry out implementation of air quality goals. And sometimes when I share this with staff, I ask them the question, well, can you use a hammer to cut a two by four to length? So I'll ask you the same question. You don't have to answer it because they never do either. Because they'd say, you know what, this is sort of a trick question, right? And, and it is. But the answer, of course, is yes, you can. You can use a hammer to do a lot of things. You could use a hammer to paint your house with. You could use a hammer to type an email. The question is, however, is that the most effective way to do that? Are you going to reach your goals? And my um, proposal to you is, no, you're not. You may fulfill your process. You may hack that 2 by 4 to length, but you're not going to be very satisfied with the results that you get, and it's going to take you a very long time. So you fulfill the process of cutting, but you don't reach your goal of building a good product. And any of those analogies we just used, you could apply, and you can go further. If you have a long drive going home today, fill in the blank. Can you do with a hammer? Yeah, you probably can. Is it the best way? And the answer is no. So what we want to talk about a little bit today, if I can make this work, there we go, is that there are more appropriate tools for different functions. And what we want to do as an agency, and as we engage industry, as we engage the public, we want to more and more and more use more appropriate tools and have better tools and more of them to do the, to, excuse me, to do the right things at the right time. So here's a little bit more background. And here's why we want to go here. So over here, we have DEQ. We'll just use that as a little image of us in our offices working away here on, you can see MAQPs and OPs. Over here on the right side represents a lot of different folks. So it represents industry, represents the public in general. And sometimes, and maybe we could say often, right in between the two is this gulf. Sometimes that gulf is real, and sometimes it's perceived, but it doesn't really make any difference because it has the same effect to keep us separate and distant. What our goal is, I'm so sorry, I'm having trouble making the equipment work here. What our goal is to be very intentional in our compliance efforts, to cross that gulf intentionally, and to make efforts to get with um, industry to get with the members of the public intentionally and to engage and to connect and to maintain that connection and to make the most of it for everybody's benefit and it's that thing that we're calling field presence. Field presence um, obviously sounds like we're going to be visiting you constantly that's not really the totality of what we mean by that phrase. Field presence for us could also mean an email, could mean a phone call, it could mean a letter, it could mean a bunch of things besides an on-site presence, which we want to have with you as well. Why? Because we want to bring the hammer? No, not necessarily. But because we want to engage with you. We want to connect. Because together, then, we can begin to meet our air quality goals. All right. How about I say we can continue to meet our air quality goals? I'll just keep playing. So it's an extended display, so it's the mouse that's part of the right Got it. All right. I keep wanting to move that little arrow off the screen. So let me describe for you a couple of tools that we want to use. There we go. The first one, perhaps you've heard a bunch about it, and if you haven't, we'd like you to hear a bunch about it. And that's this notion of compliance assistance. And that's really the very first tool that we would always like to pull out of our tool belt. That is our preferred tool for many, 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 many functions as we engage and interact with industry and the public. We want to help. We want to join together. We want to inform, and we're going to talk about that more in just a moment, so that together we can work towards this goal of compliance. And then compliance means ultimately better quality for everyone. That's a goal that we all share, and that's a goal that we all have a stake in within the state of Montana. We want to work together. Just about everything that I'm going to list beyond that then kind of falls within this. So let's elaborate a little bit more. 
The second tool that we'll pull out and we'll use is this tool of verification. And for field services and oil and gas services staff, that is a lion's share of what we do. We use so much um, resource to verify. So we're, we're looking at reports. We're coming out to visit and doing inspections. Uh, why? To bring the hammer? No. To say, hey, listen, here's how you're doing. Here's how we're working together to meet those air quality goals. Here's a place where you need to put a little bit more work in because we're missing that. Here's a place where you're doing really, really good. So that's what we're doing is we're verifying. How is the compliance effort going for you and your staff? That embodies, for certain, communication. And, and I want to just camp on this just for a minute. I chose this little icon on the right there very intentionally, and I hope that you can see what's going on there. So the blue figure is speaking in the green's language, and the green figure <coughs> is speaking in the blue's language. And what that says to me is that actual communication has transpired here. It's occurred. That both, both entities' ideas and concepts and backgrounds and needs and desires have reached and are taking root inside the other party. Really important. And I want to tell you straight up, we really desire that. And some of you know our compliance inspectors and our oil and gas inspectors, and it's very true, they are a unique bunch in that they really, really enjoy engaging you at your facility. They love it. What you do fascinates them. And I can say that with great confidence because I've been a field inspector. We can't learn enough about what you do. It's very interesting to us. We want to be able to speak your language. And we can give you the very best service the more we know from you. So I want to be very pointed. Our goal <coughs> in this field presence process is just not talking at you. It's just not making commands to you. It's not making demands of you. It is a desire to have a two-way conversation all the time. No matter what other tool we're pulling out of our belt, if you've got a problem, if you've got a good thing going on, if you've got a question, we want to connect. We want to dialogue. We need to hear what's going on in your world. And we're going to express to you what's going on in ours. We have certain responsibilities that the governor, especially, and the taxpayers are holding us accountable for, too. And we want you to be aware of that as well. So we want to communicate together. That is really key. And that is a word that gets used constantly. The meaning gets a little bit lost, but we are emphasizing more and more and more and more. That's why I offer you that little icon. That's our destination. That's what we want to do together. We want to do more of this education. And you can perhaps even see, if you've been attending CAC for any period of time, um, more and more and more emphasis here on our part to try and educate, to try and tell you why, and to try and tell you what, and what's going on out here, and why do we have to do it the way we're doing it? Why are we asking this of you? What's coming down the road? You need to know that so you can do your business and be successful in it, regardless of what your business is. So we want that to be more and more of a component. And without making any commitments to you, um, we're tossing around lots of ideas. One of the ideas may be, um, here's how to apply for a permit. Here's how to apply for a modification to a permit. Now you that are in the room, at least, um, representatives of more of our larger industrial sources, but lots of our smaller sources don't know how to do that. So why don't we tell them up front? And we have lots of electronic tools available to us. Now, why not do more of that? Now, why not educate you all? Here's what to expect when an inspector says, I'm going to be out there tomorrow at your place. What do you need to do? What do you not need to do? Why don't we inform you better? We want that to be a bigger component of how we interact with you all the time. So education, very important to us as we move forward. I want to lean on this one a little bit as well. And once again, the icon is pretty significant to us. I think in that we're not so arrogant as to think we are the kings and queens of air quality in the state of Montana. We don't do this by ourselves. We are just one component of big sky country, right? So the other components obviously are the public. Everybody in the state of Montana who breathes air is involved in this. Sometimes I say everybody from asthmatics to elk. I mean, that includes everyone, right? We have a stake in this game. 
We want this to be a collaborative effort, not just a mandate effort to the degree that we can. Everybody's got a piece of this. Special interest groups have a piece of this. The public has a, has a piece of this. Industry has a piece of this. Obviously, we do as well. That's our desire. That's our goal. When we say increase field presence, that's one of the components. We really want to be active and real as we engage. Finally, this, this notion of correction. So you look at the icon the, or the picture at the top of the screen. You can see we have a tool belt. There's, there's still a hammer in there. Um, is that our first choice? Never. Sometimes do we have to use it? Yeah. Yeah. And there's various reasons for that. Sometimes that's beneficial. Sometimes it's really challenging. But correction needs to happen. If we're on the wrong trail, you're on the wrong trail. If you had a boo-boo, we need to fix it. That's how we attain our air quality goals together. So correction needs to happen. We have various tools to do that. And another day, perhaps another CAC meeting, we'll go into that in some more detail, how that process works. Once again, some more education to happen. That's what we want to have happen together. Those are some tools that we want to bring to bear. The other thing I'd like you to know before we start into some, just a little bit of detail here, is this reality that we want this to be an entire bureau effort. This is not just our field services or classically what we would call compliance section and or our oil and gas services section. Everybody has a role in this in our bureau to greater or lesser degree. And earlier already, you've heard from Liz and you've heard from, or you will hear from Rebecca um, in our planning section. A little bit you're going to hear from Julie in our permitting section. Just a moment, you're going to hear from uh, David Geary actually twice. We all have a role in this. And we want you to know that. This is a big thing for us. Also want you to know that we have other partners in the agency, and I won't list all of them, but notably, well, we went too far, but that's okay. So our legal staff help us a lot. Sometimes our attorney has to say to me, pull up. I mean, he uses more legal language than that. But also, you may not be aware of this, some people are not, that our enforcement. We are not bringing anything before that board meeting. Um, the next one following that is August 4th. and like. Dave mentioned before, who knows what will happen. So we're scheduled for August 4th, that's where we're planning towards. Um, we'll see if it happens or not. But um, we've got Doug Kinsley is gonna go come up and talk about the quap. Once I find the mouse. <laughs> Hello, uh, as Liz mentioned, I'm Doug Kinsey with the Research and Monitoring Services section. And try to avoid operator error, at least too much of it here. Okay, um, thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about what the ambient monitoring program is up to. And essentially talk about an effort undertaken by the uh, ambient monitoring program to update our quality assurance project plan or quap as it's affectionately known. There we go. Okay, for those of you unfamiliar with what exactly a quality assurance project plan it is, I'll provide a, a brief summary, unlike the quap itself, which is fairly extensive and voluminous. Um, but basically, the quap is a, is a document which details our quality management system uh, implemented to ensure that the results of our program's activities are satisfactory and essentially um, that the data is representative that supports our monitoring objective, whether that objective would be for uh, collection of data for informational purposes for the public, uh, whether the data is to be collected for research efforts, or that data is collected for demonstration of compliance with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Secondly, is to control measurement uncertainty to basically ensure that this data is of, of the highest quality and of, of acceptable value. Excuse me. Obviously, if the data is no good um, or it is not representative of the intended object objective, it doesn't serve a valid purpose. Um, you know, really, the, the QAP is, is foundational to the ambient monitoring program's activities. and Essentially, it, it sets the standards by which we collect um, manage and submit data and report that data. Additionally, 
uh, development and maintenance of the QAP is required by the ambient uh, air surveillance rules of Part 58, Appendix A. And while the 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 elements and the uh, and the standards expressed in the the QAP itself are universal, and in many cases, a lot of modern entities have, have used this document as a template in forming their own uh, quality assurance project project plan. Uh, the Montana Quality Assurance Project Plan is specific to DEQ's activities in maintenance and operation of the state's monitoring program. Uh, having said that, I will say that uh, you know entities engaged in monitoring that is under the DEQ's purview or oversight are required to develop and submit that QAP to the DEQ under the requirements of the administrative rules of Montana. Uh, with respect to this current version, uh, it will be dated as of 2017, as Liz mentioned. It's, it will be dependent upon when we take that action to the board. We're assuming it will be with uh, this this current uh, upcoming BER in June, but uh, but basically September or October, August. August. Okay. And as far as the two, 2017 round of QAP, QAP updates, essentially. They are going to fall into three categories, administrative changes, technical changes, and regulatory provisions. Um, within the QAP itself, there is an extensive revision table which will define all the elements of the changes that are, are will take place with this revision, um, and it will be made available, uh, hopefully in the next few days, on the DEQ's website, so you'll have the opportunity to, to view the QAP itself, look at, at what changes have occurred since the 2000. 13 version and uh, actually see the document itself. And with that, I will introduce Julie Ackland. Any questions, I guess, before I depart? Thank you. so exciting. Oh boy. Nobody has any questions about it? It's just fun to say, though. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. So I'm one of the newest members of the Air Quality Bureau. and. Um, getting started with doing a lot of rulemaking for the Bureau at this point in time. Let's see if I can figure out how to work. Oh, good. So uh, we have two rulemaking activities going on in the Bureau at this point in time. One of them is something that we do on a very regular basis. It's the incorporation by reference rulemaking. This year, it will be a little more extensive than just the straightforward IBR activities we've done in the past. And one of the new projects I'm working with is the Municipal Solid Waste new set of rules that EPA adopted, and we need to go through some rulemaking to bring those into our program as well. So I'll describe a little bit about each one of those activities for you. We'll start off with the IBR. And traditionally with the IBR process, we need to adopt some federal rules, regulations, and our state statutes to keep our rules up to date. And so the ones that we'll be proposing to adopt will include the July 1st, 2016 Code of Federal Regulations the 2015 U.S. Code, and then we also have a few references to other sections of the ARM, so we'll be adopting those chapters that were in effect at the end of September 2016. And that's very standard for what we do with an IBR uh, rulemaking that we generally do yearly or around that, that amount of time. Um, but in addition to that, we've got a few more things going on this year. We also are looking at changing some of the exemptions that we have in the rules. We've had several exemptions on our books for a while. There were two uh, rules that were adopted by EPA back in 2003. However, in 2007, subpart 5J and subpart 5K were both vacated and remanded. So uh, these represent the brick and structural clay products manufacturing industry and the clay ceramics manufacturing industry. Just in 2015, EPA adopted new versions of these rules, so we would like to bring them back into our rules and no longer have them as an exemption in our rules. But that doesn't stop us from wanting to exempt new things this time around, so we have two rules that we're planning to exempt. These are both NSPS rules. One of them is subpart quad OA, and you'll be hearing more about that from Dave later today. Uh, that's for the oil and gas industry. The other one is subpart 4T, and this is part of the Clean Power Plan, and we are just uncertain about its future at this point in time. So 
we won't be adopting it at this point in time. If it seems relevant, we will adopt it the next time we go through an IPR. Additionally, we've got a few um, changes that we wanted to make into the rules. We have many sections where we reference where you can find available materials that we are identifying as reference materials in our rules. Those probably had not been updated for a while, and so we've gone through the process of updating all the contact information in those. And in addition to updating that contact information, we decided it was going to be better in the rules if we took all 13 sections of those, which basically repeated the same information, and put them just one time into the rules in the general provisions. Each of these 13 rules will still reference the reader of the rule back to the general provision section to find where you can get that contact information. It'll make future updates of that contact information a little more straightforward. And additionally to that, we are making some changes to subchapter 9. Subchapter 9 is related to permitting of major sources and major modifications in non-attainment areas. And there are just two changes we're planning to make in that section. Within the reading of the rule, we do discuss that there is um, an assumed precursor of NOx to PM 2.5 in the non-attainment areas. However, we wanted to include that with EPA's encouragement into the definition, so we'll be changing 901 part 16 there uh, to include that in the actual definition of a precursor. Additionally, we found that we needed to update um, or correct one of our internal site references. So in Rule 904, we'll be changing the reference from a 4 to a 5 so people are directed to the right rule in that um, section. And lastly, but one of our favorites that we just heard about is this QAP. Uh, currently, we have adopted the 2013 version of QAP, and we'd like to adopt the 2017 version of QAP. It's recently been updated uh, due to a number of changes, and we need to put that into our rules. So uh, that encompasses all that will be involved with the IBR rulemaking that we anticipate to bring before the board in August. The other rulemaking is my municipal solid waste landfill rule activity that I'm a little bit excited about because it really was my first project uh, here with the Bureau. And EPA back in August of 2016 they adopted two rules. One of them is an emission guidelines, and the other one is a new source performance standard. So the emission guidelines fall into subpart CF, and the NSPS is subpart XXX. Uh, these are very similar rules overseeing how landfills are operated and emissions are monitored and emissions are controlled as necessary. And I just want to point out that we actually have existing rules for landfills. And very similarly, they were a set of rules, just like this time around, with emission guidelines and CF and an NSPS for the newer sources and triple W. However, I will point out, we're not replacing the old ones. These new ones are in addition to the old ones. So what we need to do is we need to go through a Section 111D state plan rulemaking process. Uh, in order to bring the emission guidelines into the jurisdiction that the state of Montana and the department can then have oversight over those rules. If we don't go through this process, EPA would eventually be required to come in and have a federal plan and oversee the rules. So at this point in time, we've been working with the Solid Waste Advisory Council. Uh, I think I've been to three of their meetings now, presented on the background of these rules. Um, what we're planning to do in our ARM to creating rules that we're required to have as part of our state plan. Those new rules will go into ARM 17.8.340 Part 6. Currently, the existing rules that we are using are in Part 4 for the older versions of the municipal solid waste and fill rules. And I just wanted to give a little bit of history um, and background about landfills in Montana. Um, I know we've got MDU here. I'm not sure how much work others have done with landfills. The solid waste program here in DEQ refers to these landfills as their class two landfills. And right now there are 28 landfills in the state of Montana that the air quality <coughs> has overseen. There's four additional ones that the solid waste program licenses that are on regular reservations, but the Air Quality Bureau won't be overseeing those. However, all 32 of them 
will need to comply with these rules, whether it's through our state oversight or through a federal plan um, that will happen on reservations. At this point in time, most of these landfills are expected to start off as existing sources under the uh, subpart CF emission guidelines. However, we've got a number of them that have gone through um, license expansions already, but they haven't commenced construction on those expansions. We have others that are planning permits for brand new landfills as well, and those will all then fall under the subpart triple X regulations. Um, let's see, so this one highlights some of the differences that we have uh, between the old set of rules and the new set of rules. And one of the big differences is that we have an additional method for estimating emissions from landfills. We used to have a three-tiered system. Now with the new rules, we'll have a fourth tier in that system. And it's important to um, estimate <coughs> emissions only if you are a larger landfill. And identifying what your emissions are helps identify whether you're above or below a threshold that's going to require you to install a gas collection control system. Um, Part of the new rule was to lower that threshold, so it went from a 50 ton per year emission rate of non-methane organic compounds down to a 34 ton per year emission rate. And at this point in time, we've got about four facilities with gas collection and control systems already operating at their facility, and we anticipate with the drop in the threshold that we'll add one more facility uh, needing to have a gas collection and control system installed. Additionally, one of the other big things for the landfills will be that those that do have gas collection and control systems, there will be a higher level of monitoring that needs to occur at those landfills uh, to manage the gas collection and control systems. So that's kind of a highlight of what we've got going on with municipal solid waste rules. I do want to point out that the newest information that came out last week is that they have announced that they are planning a 90-day stay on these rules. Uh, information went out by a letter to several of the uh, industry age, industry groups, and I haven't seen a copy of it yet. I asked our Region 8 EPA contact, and he hasn't seen a copy of that letter yet. But I anticipate that the Federal Register sometime in the near future will be announcing that 90-day stay. So we're not certain where the rules are going to end up. Um, we're going to be tracking them, and we we'll, eventually we'll be going before the board to do a rulemaking if that's appropriate. If you have any questions about the rulemakings, I'm happy to answer those if I can. If not, I think we got a break at this point in time. So, do you want us back in a few minutes? Or? Yeah, so we have a break on the agenda. Let's say we'll do 10 minutes. Um, it's 3 o'clock, so we'll come back at 310. Uh, for those in the room, there is coffee and some snacks in the back. Um, for those on the phone, we'll just holler at you when 10 minutes are up and start again with some project updates.
Yeah, well, that's what I said. You know, I don't know what everybody thought. I was like, oh, we didn't know what all that. I'm very thorough in her searching, so. Thank you. 
Okay, everybody in the room and on the phone. We'll get started again. You can get back to your seats. everybody. If you're on the phone, hopefully you're back. Um, sorry if there is some uh, feedback on the phone. Um, we did hear that if you switch over to the audio on just the YouTube video, um, that might be better. Um, and then you could still potentially use the phone to talk to us if you need to do that. Um, we, we would love it if you would talk to us, but um, <laughs> not to discourage you there. Um, so we will get started again for the second half of the meeting. I think this should be a little bit shorter than the first. We're going to tell you about some of the projects we've been working on in the Air Quality Bureau, um, just give you some updates since we last met in September. We've been doing a lot. So with that, I'll get David Gary back up here to talk about the oil and gas services section. I, you can actually click it. Oh, I don't think it. oh yeah. One of the benefits of not doing the fancy animations and just having a simple slide. <laughs> so, um, here to update you on, on our um, oil and natural gas production project, if you will. What this is, is I think we've been updating the CAC for a while now, that we have this vision of an oil and gas registration program that kind of encompasses all the requirements from all the different regulations, state and federal, put them in one place in our registration program. And so that, yeah, you might have some more stringent requirements in our Montana program, but at least you'd have a one-stop shop to determine what you're subject to. You wouldn't have to go to the many different places um, to determine what roles apply to you. So that's a vision that we have. It seems to be well, well received with our regulated stakeholders. And I think last September, um, I shared that we we're nearly complete conducting analysis on our Montana requirements against all the other um, requirements out there and that we would be ready to form a work group in about a month. And lo and behold, that didn't happen because right, the regulatory lands, landscape maybe changed a little bit. We saw some potential changes coming up and we don't want to change our program to something that we know we're going to have to change in the near future. So we just decided, hey, we need to take a take a take a step back and kind of watch watch where we end up with um, these six rules that we've been watching that I presented it back in September. So today the, the, really the idea is just to kind of mention those six rules and what I know about them and then please if you know something that I don't if 
um, on any of them, please speak up and share. You're certainly not going to insult me if you know something I don't. I would uh, appreciate the information because sometimes tracking down this information is, is hard to find. So the, the first rule that we were tracking was the Federal Implementation Plan, um, Minor Net NSR on Indian lands for the oil and gas sector. And um, I think I announced in September that this rule was final, and the only reason I have it on the list today is mentioned that it, it's final, and I haven't heard anything regarding um, any kind of challenge to the rule or anything like that. So if you, if you guys know different, please share again. Same with the source determination rule. That was the rule to determine um, when these upstream oil and gas well facilities might be considered the same source or, or not. Um, that was final in September, last September as well. But I have heard nothing regarding challenges or any um, re potential revisions to that rule. The next one is the new, new source performance standard that um, Ju Julie mentioned in her presentation. Quad OA is it's um, become, become referred to. It was final last September as well, but this was a big indicator of one that we needed to take a step back and watch um, because a lot of things going on with it. But anyways, around April 4th, I think it was, EPA actually um, published in the Federal Register its plan to review Quad OA and determine whether it should remain the same, be revoked, or anything in between. And so um, we'll really need to know where this one ends up with before we do anything regarding our vision for our program um, because, like I said, we don't want to change something that we'll have to change in the near future. So um, it, dual to that, a, a couple weeks after that April 4th time frame, EPA also announced that um, it's planned to reconsider certain por portions of Quadaway, specifically the fugitive emissions requirements. Um, and they actually issued a 90 stay on complying with those fugitive emission requirements, a 90 day stay. So um, the compliance date was June 3rd for, the, for those requirements, and it's been postponed 90 days. So we're eagerly watching that, watching the EPA website, and keeping our um, ears to the ground, if you will, to see, where the, see if we can find out any news on where that might shake out. The fourth rule that we're kind of keeping an eye on was the control technique guidelines rule. This didn't impact Montana greatly because we have no ozone non-attainment areas. Um, however, what was why we were tracking it is it was kind of being viewed as a blueprint for um, states to regulate existing storage, existing sources in the oil gas industry. Um, that went final actually right after our last CAP meeting, October um, 20th, 2016, and I, I haven't heard anything regarding any challenge or potential revisions to those CTGs. The one, two, three, four. Fifth item was the information collection request for the oil and gas industry. Um, second draft was issued right after our last CAC meeting, or maybe right before, September 23rd anyways. Um, they issued the final ICR on November 10th, 2016. However, March 2nd of this year, um, the ICR was withdrawn. And so the ICR, in a nutshell, what that was, was an information collection request out to the oil and gas industry to determine what requirements may be appropriate um, for existing sources under 111D for that sector. But that was withdrawn March of this year, so no longer going on. And the sixth rule that we were keeping an eye on that has had a lot of activity is was the BLM rule. All those previous five were EPA rules. Um, BLM's waste prevention production subject to royalties and resource conservation rule. Well, that's a mouthful even for air quality guys. Um, that's been basically known as the venting and flaring, BLM venting and flaring rule. So that went final last November um, with an effective date of this January. However, um, things that have happened since then, um, that November right, right after it went final actually, Wyoming and Montana's attorney generals filed a lawsuit regarding um, BLM's authority to issue those rules. Um, and as far as I know, that's just still standing um, in the courts. Then at the federal le level, there was also activity um, under the Congressional Review Act, where um, I think it was, let's see, about February, 
U.S. House of Representatives passed a joint resolution that would basically repeal those that those rules. Um, they transmitted it to the U.S. Senate, and on May 10th, it, that joint resolution did not pass the Senate, so those rules still exist today. However, um, there's a chance that there's still activity going on within the Department of the Interior, so under the executive branch rather than the legis legislative branch, at looking at maybe blocking or revoking or revising those rules. So we're still kind of got our ears to the ground on anything on that front that might affect that rule as well before we make the changes to our program. And that was what I got for an update for that project, but we'll certainly stand for questions, or maybe even more importantly, any information that you guys might have different to what I shared today, or in addition to what I shared. No? Nope. Alrighty, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Rebecca Harvey. She's gonna come up and flatter you with a Nice presentation on re regional haze. Okay. Well, thanks, Dave. That was a nice introduction. <laughs> um, as Dave said, yeah, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about regional haze today. Uh, first, I just wanted to give a little bit of background before I get started. We did talk about regional haze in September at the CAC meeting, but I know not all of you were able to make it to that meeting. Um, so for those who weren't here, as a quick refresher, why are we even talking about regional haze today? Uh, first of all, the regional haze program affects a lot of our large um, sources of air emissions in Montana. Um, currently those include the Portland cement kiln plants, kilns, um, and also coal-fired power plants. Um, in the future, that may include things like other power plants, uh, refineries, and just other large industrial sources around the state. Despite all of the impacts on Montana sources, um, when the regional haze rule was published back in the early 2000s, Montana just didn't really have the resources to deal with that program, and so that resulted in EPA publishing a federal implementation plan. So really, EPA has been in charge of controlling our sources under regional haze in Montana for the last decade or so. Um, the, I guess the upside of that is that the way the Regional Haze Program works is it's on 10-year implementation periods. So we're currently pushing up against the end of that first 10-year period, and EPA had control or the, took the lead for that period. But each time we have a new implementation period, the state gets another opportunity to take back control or gain administrative authority for the program. And so the next 10-year period is from 2018 to 2028. And so as you can tell, we're, we're right at this, almost at the start of that. And we think it might be time to consider getting back in the driver's seat for regional haze. Um, that's pretty much why Governor Bullock um, last year published his energy blueprint and included a directive to the agency to take back control of the regional haze program for that second implementation period. So. With that all said, today I just want to start with some updates since we last met. It's been a few months since our last meeting and um, a lot has been happening with the Regional Haze Program, both within the state of Montana and at the federal level. The first thing we had was a final revision of the Regional Haze Rule. So that rule originally came out in 1999, um, but just in January revisions went final. And some of the highlights there are the rule revisions really try to get more specifically at man-made emissions and the impacts of those emissions on visibility. Um, so we're really looking at trying to remove consideration of the impacts from wildfire smoke, for example, which is one of the big causes of haze in Montana. And another one of the highlights is the rule really tries to provide states with a little more flexibility to consider international emissions and emissions from things like prescribed fire. Um, so that gives us a little more leeway to get at the emissions we can control that are coming from sources within our state. The next thing you may have seen if you're paying attention to regional haze is we just saw a revision to the 2012 federal implementation plan. Um, EPA just published that and we're actually in an open public comment period right now through May 30th. And some of the highlights there, um, EPA is proposing to revise the NOx limit um, for the Old Castle uh, cement plant, the Trident Kiln. 
And they're also proposing to make some corrections to a reasonable progress source, and that is the Blaine County Compressor Station, currently operated by Northwestern Energy. So the correction there is to, it actually it results in that compressor station dropping out of the federal implementation plan and not having controls required. In addition, we also have a complete draft of a regional haze progress report that we're circulating for internal review right now. Um, and on that note, some of you may be wondering, well, what progress report? I don't think we talked about a progress report in September, the last time we met. Um, so just a little background on what that means and what we're talking about. The regional haze rule requires uh, states prepare a periodic progress report. And that's really intended to be a mid-course check-in on that 10-year implementation period. And so the FIP was published in 2012. So five years after that, 2017, we have a progress report due this year, um, this fall, actually. And the progress report is really going to give some details about the progress that's been made since the FIP was published. So progress to improve visibility across the state of Montana that has resulted from that initial plan or the FIP. And finally, it is a SIP submittal. So what that means is it is in the Code of Federal Regulations as a SIP, um, and that means we re are required to get the official governor's signature on it and provide the official 30-day public comment period, submit it to EPA for action um, that would go into the Federal Register. So just a little more detail on the progress report. This is really just a high-level um, table of contents, basically, for a progress report, just so you're all aware of what's going to be in that. Um, EPA is very specific about what a progress report should contain. And basically, we're reporting on the control measures that were included in the FIP. And you know, looking at how they've been implemented to this date, to date, um, and whether emission reductions have resulted from those control measures. We're also going to be looking at current visibility conditions across the state and comparing those visibility conditions to what they were before the FIP was published um, and seeing whether we've made progress in those areas. On the whole, the progress report really will describe whether the control measures identified in the initial plan, the FIP, were adequate to make progress in visibility um, toward the 2018 goals that were identified in the FIP. So we're really going to be looking at um, a determination of adequacy, as you'll see at the bottom of the slide there, um, was that FIP adequate to make progress in visibility? So you may have picked up, we're really talking about two different things when we talk about regional haze. We're talking about the progress report first, and then we're talking about that next SIP, the 2018 to 2028 state implementation plan. So just to give you a little bit of current status on both of those, for the progress report, um, we're just with CAC today um, in the beginning processes of our um, stakeholder engagement. And we also met with the affected facilities. So that would be the facilities that had control measures required under the FIP. Um, and just for everybody's information, that would include um, Ashgrove and Talon, who are in the room today, and also uh, Old Castle and the Trident Kiln. With the 2018 to 2028 SIP, uh, we're really just staying involved in a regional process right now. Um, we work with a regional organization of air agencies called Westar, um, and then the uh, Western Regional Air Partnership, or RAP, and they're the ones who are going to be working on that technical analysis. Um, hopefully that will be kicking off at least at the end of this year or early next year, but as a state we'll be staying engaged, um, providing information as they need it at the regional level. Where are we headed with both of these next? With the progress report, the next step will include a federal land manager consultation. So that is required in the regional haze rule. Uh, we'll be providing 60 days of cons consultation with the FLMs, federal land managers, and then also the public comment period for 30 days and an opportunity for public hearing. Um, so you'll be seeing that probably sometime this summer, July, August timeframe. And that is all so we can meet our goal of hopefully submitting this progress report to EPA in October of this year. And then for the second SIP, that will be due in 2021. Um, so another thing I didn't mention earlier that the rural revisions really helped us out with 
So they pushed the due date for that second SIP back from 2018 to 2021. So we get a little extra time, three more years, um, which will be great <laughs> since we're all new to regional haze. Um, and really what we'll be looking at there is working with the regional technical analysis to try to figure out which facilities around the state of Montana have emissions that are impacting visibility and will be subject to reasonable progress controls. We don't know where that's going to end up now. Um, that's something that, you know, it's in the future at this point. We're working one step at a time trying to get the progress report completed and submitted. Um, but then, of course, we don't really get much of a break because we're going to be jumping right into that second SIP. So pulling all of that together, just a little um, snapshot of our regional haze project timeline for the next four years or so. Um, you can see that we're really dealing with the progress report through this fall, so through October when we submit it to EPA. And then, as I said, we don't get a break um, late October. We're jumping right into that technical analysis at the regional level and working toward the next planning period. And that's all I have for you today. Quick update. Um, does anybody have any questions today on regional haze on the phone? All right. Thanks. Yes, so next on the agenda, you have Julie Merkel with our permitting section talking about her project. Hi there. So um, if you were here in September, you heard me talk about our little permitting project and what kind of changes we're planning on making. Um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of what we're doing and uh, some progress that we've made since we last talked to you. Um, so we're making some changes in the in the permitting program. We call it some people call it the P PIP, some people call it the PIP. <laughs> the first P is silent, so I call it PIP. <laughs> um, so why are we making changes? Nobody likes change, right? But really our our universe of um, permitted facilities are changing. Our world out there is changing, so we need to change too. We we need to do better. We need to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak, and um, so we're embarking on this project to to streamline the process of with certain industry types, and then we um, but we still have to maintain uh, air, good air quality. So we're looking at doing permits by rule or registration. We already have a very successful oil and gas registration registration program. And we really need to do more of that. We have several different industry types that are have um, really basically the same conditions, same requirements in them. Um, I'll stop short of calling them cookie cutter uh, permits, but they kind of are. They're they're very similar. And if we can get those through the process quicker, then we can spend more time on the larger facilities that we need to, and also. Um, you heard Hobie and Dave talk about more field presence. Um, we, maybe the permitters will be spend more time in the field. I know they're watching me, so <laughs> they'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> so the registration program, the facility, you know, said, hey, DEQ, I have all this equipment. I want to operate um, in my facility. Once they go through that process, basically they have a permit and they can operate. They don't have to go through the MAQP process, which can, which can take um, a lot more time than they have to get on site and start doing their work. With the crush, crushing and screening industry is what we're tackling first. Um, I'm going to throw in there concrete batch plants because I think we're going to do them at the same time. Um, and like I said before, th these folks have the same conditions in their permits, basically, um, with just a few tweaks. And if we, we, what we need to do is develop this program so we can assure compliance um, with the regulations and maintain um, good air quality. So the advantages of registration for the facilities is that they it'll take less time and money for them to, um, you know, submit an application. They just do the registration form. It'll be a lot quicker. Uh, and then for for DEQ too, there will be less processing time, so it will uh, save our resources as well. They won't have to wait, like I said before, for the whole MAQ. Well, we do have draft rules, and I'm going to emphasize the draft. 
I'm actually on my draft rules it says draft draft. <laughs> Um, because right now what we're doing is we've, we've had, admittedly, we've had a very small group of folks working on these rules. So we are going through a very robust, um, intense internal review of these rules, um, first within the Bureau and then throughout the department, uh, up the chain. And um, then we will, I mean, they're certainly not ready for public consumption at this time. Uh, we've also done a lot of research on uh, our MEPA requirements and how we can satisfy those. Uh, right now, we do an uh, environmental assessment on every single portable facility. So we might be doing uh, looking at the impacts to the environment if they're home pit. And actually, they're going to be working at all these other places. So it, it doesn't quite make sense to us. Um, they also move into uh, permitted open cut pits who have also gone through an environmental assessment. So we're, maybe a programmatic uh, MEPA analysis will occur at rulemaking. Uh, we're just looking at different, different options out there. So after we get through our internal review of the rules, then we're going to have um, a lot of stakeholder involvement. So I'm going to go back to that word draft. So these, are only, these are our ideas. This is a regulatory um, picture of what we think will work for this industry. We need to get their, in, their input and work together to kind of get the best product that we can. Efficient and effective, that's what we have to be. Um, so yeah, we're in the planning phases right now to get the stakeholder process moving. And I guess I'll probably update you at the next CAC meeting. Are there any questions, comments? Okay. We're going to ask Mr. Kinsley to come back up. Okay, thank you, Julie. Okay, so I will now talk about the EMEA Monitoring Program's annual monitoring network <coughs> plan. So, all state and local air monitoring organizations are required. I've got to add myself up. That's okay. Are required to develop and submit a monitoring network plan, obviously annually, as the title would indicate, as required by 40 CFR Part 5810. Uh, the intent of the document is essentially to define the current network as it exists today. Secondly, establish conformity or any deviation from the monitoring rules in terms of EPA's uh, network design criteria, um, siting criteria, or quality assurance criteria. Also, uh, the plan will address any network changes that have occurred since the, the last uh, um, submission of the network plan and also address any future modifications that will occur in this next monitoring cycle, which is essentially the 2017 uh, monitoring year. And although not specifically addressed or mentioned in the rule, the intent is clear through the public comment process and also certainly it's our desire to provide an opportunity for stakeholder engagement to get feedback as to what uh, the public and, and the community in large feels is necessary for the state of Montana in addressing air quality issues. <laughs> so as far as the 2017 network plan changes and also uh, <coughs> modifications to you know, how we're going to address the implemented rule. Uh, we're going to propose through this next plan, essentially and this has already been complete, uh, we have relocated the, a monitor representing the Sydney area in Richland County to a location about 10 miles to the northwest of the current location. That site was, the original site was decommissioned and the new site established in the week of, uh, of May 20, or I'm sorry, April 24th. So the site, within a week, we removed the old site, reestablished the new site, and began collecting regulatory quality data. And basically, the objective remains the same in, in assessing impacts from the oil and gas industry. And secondly, we are going to we plan to seek a waiver from the requirement to monitor lead in the community of Colstrip. In the past several years, we have deferred monitoring 
uh, due to resource constraints, but going forward we will look to submit a modeling demonstration um, basically to demonstrate that, that we do meet the, the provisions of that rule. And essentially it, it is authorized in certain uh, land requirements in, in Part uh, 58 of the CFR, 40 CFR. And lastly, we'll uh, install two additional PM 2.5 monitors, 2.5 being uh, fine particulate less than 2.5 microns in diameter. The first site is the first monitor will be placed at the existing Thompson Falls site, which will be operating in conjunction with the with a PM10 monitor that has, has been in operation for a very, very long time. And secondly, we installed a site, a new site in Dillon, and again operating as a 2.5 monitor. Uh, as far as the, the, the timeline for submission of this document, we have to account for a 30-day public inspection and comment period prior to submission of our plan to Region 8 by July 1st. Then on receipt, EPA has uh, 120 days to approve or disapprove any elements of the plan, um, and they can piecemeal that. that it's not an overall encompassing stamp of approval or a denial, but essentially they can make and choose certain elements that we have proposed. Um, I guess one thing of note before I hit this slide, uh, in terms of EPA's ability to approve or disapprove monitors, that would only deal with uh, regulatory monitors or monitors that are installed to meet certain design criteria. So informational monitors that we operate for public uh, information, such as the, the examples that with Thompson Falls and Dillon, uh, we can we can uh, in, we can start or discontinue our discretion. So as far as addressing the public inspection comment period, uh, obviously to meet our deadline, the plan is to, to post that on the DEQ's website on or before June 1st, currently it's with an internal review and we hope to get that out um, next week ideally. So, and after sometime in the next week, feel free to go to the website and uh, see a little bit more in detail of what the network consists of and also more detail regarding the proposed changes that we tend to make or have already made. So, with that, that's all I have. Any questions? very much. I will turn it over to Rebecca to conclude today's meeting. Okay, we're done early. It's not even four o'clock yet. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, just to wrap up, I just wanted to thank everybody so much for staying engaged with CAC. Um, I know some of you drove quite a ways or traveled quite a ways to be here. Um, those on the phone, sorry about the technical difficulties. We're obviously still working out the kinks with 21st century technology. Um, we will uh, hopefully be back in a quarter. Um, so our goal is to make these meetings as open as, and as engaging as possible. Um, for all of you. We don't want to have meetings just for the sake of having meetings and have you come all the way here to hear us blab about things you already know. Um, so one quarter, Liz told me, would be about in August or September. Does anybody have a preference of pre or post Labor Day? I'm getting a lot of shape. Now for EPA, for our NESHAP reports and that kind of stuff. And I know it, it kind of seemed like you were in, in indicating Montana separate electronic reporting, but are you guys looking at getting into being able to access said reports and doing that kind of thing uh, so that we don't have to submit paper reports on top of the electronic reports? That, yeah. Are you guys thinking yeah, of that? Yeah. And the component that has to happen first is, is important, and that is verification of identity. Mm -hmm. So how do we establish this is really Jeff who's submitting this report. It's not somebody else hacking into the system or using this as a conduit to hack into the person. So that's, that's the big component right now. And then once we can get that in place, then um, it actually gets pretty monumental in that. What do we electronically do with the information we're receiving? And, and how does that get stored? And how does that appropriately be made available to the public? Et cetera. So it becomes a lot of steps that we have to walk through procedurally, in addition just to the IT component. But, but we're really, really, really wanting to be engaged in that whole process. Yeah. But, but 
the verification shouldn't be any problem because EPA's SEDRI website has more <laughs> uh, more security on it than probably NSA's, I would guess. But, so, like, <laughs> public comment, yeah. so it's all. Yeah. And God forbid if you forget any of the security questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your password is storage and you know history all those kinds of things which is a huge benefit mm -hmm. anyone else have questions Does anyone on the phone questions or comments dead silence I'm gonna take that as a no oh, I, I just, <laughs> go ahead I mean I think we're all kind of watching the board of environmental environmental review process and where that ends up if there's some Yeah, sure. For anyone on the phone. Everybody's watching it, but if we know kind of what, if, especially in the case that it's involved, if we know what needs to be reported. Yeah, sure. Um, if you're on the phone and you missed that for any reason, um, we are all paying attention to what's going on with the Board of Environmental Review um, from the legislature, and we will certainly update CAC as we learn more about that. I guess that's, I have a question for you guys. Is it better to have random email updates? Is that a benefit if something um, large comes through, for example, the board? Or is it, um, would you prefer this format? Or both? Is it a both kind of thing? I think both, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Set out update. For those big things. Yeah, okay. Out. Okay. Great, thanks. Okay. I think with that, we're done. You can also always, of course, send questions, comments, concerns to me. Uh, you can also send them to Liz. I think she also volunteered herself. Um, so just, yeah, keep us up to date with what your needs are, and we'll try to do our best to meet them. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>